Okay, so from here, from the EC2 dashboard, you can click Launch Instance and Launch Instance. And we will give our server a name. So we'll call it uh, Fast API Demo, I guess. Fast API Demo. And here, <clears throat> here you'll pick an operating system. And so um, I typically use Ubuntu because it's the best supported operating system for a lot of packages. Um, it's a good default. Um, we'll come down here, we pick our server type. So T2 Micro, it shows you here that it's free tier eligible. So if you've had an AWS account for less than a year, um, you can run one of these for free. And this is usually fine to run an API. Um, then to log in, you need a key pair, an SSH key pair. And so if you don't have any in your account, um, you can click create a new key pair and give it a name. So let's give it the same name, say Fast API demo. It doesn't have to be the same, it can be anything, uh, but we'll just call it that. And this is just going to create a file and it's, it's going to create two files, give you one of them and put one on the server. And this is kind of how you handshake with your server. And so it's how it's your credentials basically. So instead of using a password, you'll use this file to connect to your server um, through SSH, which we'll do in a minute. You click create key pair and you can see down here it downloaded. So I'll grab that in a minute. Um, and then down here we set up the network. So you can leave this as it is if you want, and all that you'll initially be able to do is connect um, via SSH, which is port 22. And so this just lets you get into your server with a shell, with an SSH client, and you know do system administration or whatever. Um, if you click these, they'll open up uh, HTTPS is port 443, and HTTP is port 80. Um, so if you were launching a server in production, you'd probably want HTTPS exposed. Um, we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is set up FastAPI to run on port 8000. And so we'll open up port 8000 in a separate step and just talk directly to that. Generally not what you do in production, but for development, it's fine. Um, set up how much storage you want to give it. And then you can click launch instance. Um, I don't think there's anything in here we need to change. Um, we can just leave all this alone. Um, so yeah, we click launch instance. It only takes a couple seconds. <clears throat> and then it will show us that it was successful. So if you click on this, it'll take you to the details for that instance, where you click here, it'll show you all of your instances that you've got um, active. And so if we refresh this now, um, this is the one we just launched. And you can see it's pending and it'll only take a few seconds before this um, is green when it's booted up. Okay, so now it's green. We can log in if we want to. Um, which we do. So there's two different, well, there's a few different ways that you can do this. Um, if you aren't familiar with SSH or if you don't have an SSH client installed on your computer, you can just click this connect button and then click connect and it will open in your browser um, this window here, which will connect you to your server and you can do whatever you want this way. So now we're in our server um, and I'll, what I'll do here is I'll make a file just to prove that it's the same machine, um, we'll call it test file text. And say this is a file. Um, whoops. And so now we've got this test file. Um, I'm going to exit out of this connect tab. You, it's fine to work in here if you want. Um, I don't like this particular interface, so I'm going to use my own uh, client. So I'm going to exit this, and it just hangs forever. So you just close this tab. What I'm going to do instead is I'll bring up a terminal on my computer and I'm going to connect to it that way. So, um, so first of all, I want to make a directory here. I'll call it uh, fast API tutorial and I'll go into it and I'll grab that key, this fast API demo key that we just downloaded from downloads, uh, fast API demo. So that's here. And then to connect to our server, we use this SSH command line tool. Um, it's installed in Linux by default in every distribution, I think, or most distributions. Um, if you're not on Linux or if you don't have a tool like this, it'll tell you over here um, what you can do. So for example, if you're on Windows and you're using PuTTY, you can download PuTTY, I think it's free, um, and set it up like this. Um, these are, I think, the two main ways to do it. Um, so this SSH client is what I'm doing here. So I'm going to get my private key file, which is what I just did. I moved it over. And then we're going to run this command. And what this does is it tells the, the system not to let any other user read the contents of this file because it's kind of like a password. 
So if we copy this and paste it before we connect, um, we can see this. Um, if we look at the details, um, can you guys see this text okay? Is this big enough? Yes, it's visible, yeah, correct. Okay. Um, yeah, you can see the details of the file and this 400 is a permissions setting. It means four means read, um, zero means don't let me do anything. And so this R means only the user that owns this file can read this um, key basically. Um, and then we can connect to our server with this command here. This is one way to do it. So we should be able to just paste this in here now and connect to our server. And here we are. And if we look at the files in this directory, we see we have this test file.txt. So that's a good start. So we've got our server running and we're connected to it. Um, so I'm going to clear this. Now, what I typically do when I'm working on a server is I use a program called Tmux. And so if you so if you see down at the bottom, when I run it, there's a little bar that shows up, this blue bar here. Um, it's a, it'll probably be green for you if you're new to this. But um, what I can do now is I can create multiple windows and I can split my window and I can um, do things like this. So this allows a couple of different things. Um, first of all, it lets you work. Um, you can have a bunch of different programs open, like a text editor. You can have different files open. You can navigate around your system, turn your server on and off and stuff like that. So it's really handy. You don't have to open a whole bunch of windows on your machine. Um, you just open this program called Tmux. So it's, it's amazing. Um, if you, you can look up at like a Tmux cheat sheet, for example, to get started. And there's, there's a few commands that you need to learn. So like control B, you press control B, that's your leader key, and then some other key to do something. So for example, um, if I have just one window here and I press control B and then double quotes like this one here, um, it'll split my window horizontally. So now I have two panes that I can go back and forth between. So this control B O, this will take me between these two panes. Um, so I won't go too much into Tmux, but basically it's a, if you're logged into a server, it's an extremely helpful tool. Um, there's a tool called GNU Screen. That's the same idea that people like as well. But anyway, um, okay, so we've, we're in our server. We've got Tmux running. Um, and so the next thing we want to do uh, probably is to install FastAPI. So what we'll do is we'll create a Python virtual environment um, and we'll install FastAPI into that virtual environment. And then we'll turn it on and then we'll open up port 8000 so that we can talk to our fast API program. So here, whoops, um, just remove this. We don't really have anything in this directory. Um, so if you type Python 3 M for module and then then and then what this will do, uh, it's not installed, so we'll install it. Um, what this will do, this then is short for virtual environment. Um, why is this not working? Uh, maybe I have to do this first. Um, yeah, so I just did a bunch there. So what I'm doing here is I'm updating the package list on the server so that I can install this um, Python 3 then, so this here. And this program, Python 3.ven, um, is, if it lets us install it, it lets us create um, what's called a virtual environment, which lets us contain all of our dependencies for our program in one place. So say you have four or five or 10 different programs on a machine, they might need different versions of a specific package. So say the requests package is really popular. Maybe you need version 2.1 in one project and 2.7 in another project. Um, if you have virtual environments, you can just turn them on and off um, based on whichever project you're working on. So we'll install it and then we'll create one, which is what I tried to do a second ago and it failed. Um, and then we'll install fast API. Um, so this we can ignore. This is just asking us if we want to restart any services. We don't really have to. Um, so we run this command here. App, uh, whoops, so we want sudo, sudo apt install just means install a package on this machine. Um, oh, I already did that, I'm sorry. Um, we want this one. So run the virtual environment package that we just, ran, uh, just installed. And so now we've got this directory called ben. Uh, note that we could have typed anything here, so like myven or fastapi vem, for example, um, and these will be two different directories, and um, we just we want to turn one of them on, roughly speaking. So we'll remove this fastapi one, and the way that you activate it on uh, Linux is you type source, uh, and then the name of the file, 
Um, so the bin, bin, bin activate is the, is the script. And you'll see over here now it shows this bin. So this means our virtual environment is active. Um, I just want to see and install this other program called tree, um, just so we can visualize our tree structure of our file system. So if we say tree, then uh, well, that's too many files. <laughs> Let's do this. Um, if we output this like this, um, this lets us see what's in the virtual environment. So you've got these scripts here. So then bin activate is this here. This is, we basically run this program to activate our virtual environment. And then you have here your site packages directory. This is where we're going to install fast API to. Um, you don't really have to know that, but um, might be helpful to know. So, okay, so now that this is installed, what we can do um, is we can say pip3 install. Um, pip install like this would also work. Um, so we'll do pip3 because it's Python 3. Um, and we're going to install fast API. But what we want to do first is come to the documentation. Um, so this is fast API. Um, it's, it's an amazing API framework. Uh, I'd recommend if you're just getting started with APIs, this is a good one um, to learn, especially if you know a little bit of Python. Um, there's lots of other ones like ExpressJS and JavaScript or, or Flask and Python or um, you know, Sinatra and Ruby or whatever, but um, this is a good one. And so down here is the installation instructions. Um, so the first thing to install is FastAPI itself. And then we install this here. This Uvicorn is the server that will run our program. So <clears throat> we can do these in one step. Um, we'll just do it in two because they're doing it in two here. Um, so we just type pip3 install fast API and it's done. And so now if we were to say Python 3 and say import fast API, it'll, it doesn't show us a message, which means it worked properly. And if we were to deactivate our um, virtual environment and then try the same thing, um, we'll get this no module named fast API. So that's just a good way to check that you've installed the package um, into your virtual environment, which is what you want to do. Um, okay, and so then we're going to install this. And this just basically gives us this uvicorn command that we can run um, to start up our server. So the next step here is to just create a simple dummy file. Um, and we'll make it even simpler than this. Um, here they're saying import this um, typing package. So this is for um, type hinting in Python. It's up to you whether you want to use this, but it lets you write statements um, this here. So this is saying union is a particular kind of data structure in Python. I think this is probably unnecessarily complicated for a, a simple tutorial, but um, anyway, so there's that. And then there's this, this is what we want to do is import fast API. We're going to start our app um, and then we're going to set up a single route here. So when we call the root of our, our, our API, so like nothing after the slash, then all it's going to do is return this JSON, which says hello world. So if we copy this um, into a file, um, so they're calling it main.py here. So we'll do the same and we'll paste it in here. Now note that I am, I'm writing this code directly on the server. Typically what people will do is write it locally and then push it up to GitHub or GitLab or something, and then pull it down to the server. So you test it in development on your own machine, but um, I like working on servers uh, as development environments. So your mileage may vary, but yeah, so I'm going to delete that. And so this here, these five lines, one, two, three, four, five lines, this is enough to define an API. So what we'll do is we'll launch this um, and then we'll open port 8,000 and we'll pull this hello world into our bubble app and then we'll modify this a little bit. So if I save this, uh, it shows us down here that we can run our app like this. So we paste this in and, um, oh, so it's saying this uvicorn command is not found. That's because when you open a new shell, um, your virtual environment is not active. It's only active for the shells that you specifically run that source command. So if we say source, um, then bin activate, then we should be able to run it. Um, so it's saying call this command uvicorn, run our main file, which is this file here and call the app function, which is uh, this create an app object, sort of. Um, so fire this. And then this reload flag says, anytime something in our file changes, um, then it's going to reload the server. So you can see when I save it down here, it reloads. 
So that's all that is. Um, and so now if we were to try to call this server, it's not going to work um, because over here in EC2, um, that port is closed. So uh, we can test it. We can test it in a couple different ways. Um, what I'll do is I'll set it up directly in bubble um, rather than some third party tool. Typically, I would use insomnia.rest. Um, this insomnia program is my favorite HTTP testing tool, but um, so check this out if you're interested. But we'll just set it up in Bubble. Bubble's a fine testing tool as well. So by default, when you use, this is a brand new Bubble app. There's nothing in it. Um, it's just um, empty. So we come to Plugins and Add Plugins, and we want to install API Connector, which is there. And now we're going to add an API, and we'll say, I don't know, custom fast API or whatever. It can be anything. And then we're going to add a call. We're going to call this root method here. So what we need to do is pass in the location of our server. So right now, the location of our server is um, it's this IP address. So we can just paste this in. Um, if you're doing this in production, typically what you would do is you would set up a static IP address on your server. So using elastic IPs. Um, you would associate a fixed IP address with the server, because if you don't, then anytime the server goes down, um, it gets a new IP address. So if you reboot the machine, uh, that IP address is going to change. So um, just show you quickly how you would do that. You just say um, elastic IP address and you allocate one, which means give me one for my account. You click allocate. Um, and now we have this and we want to associate it with our server. So the instance we want is this one here. So we click that and associate. And so now the IP address of our server um, isn't what it initially was. It's this new static IP address. And so now actually this connection over here is not working anymore. So I'm banging on the keys and I can't do anything. So this shell session has ended um, or has disconnected rather. And this is kind of um, handy to show actually. This is the second reason that running Tmux on a server is really helpful because what I can do now is I can open it um, another window. So I have to close this. I can't do anything. Um, but I can open a new window and connect again. And I can say tmux attach. Um, so I have to change the IP address though here. So this was the old IP address. I want the new one, which is what we just allocated. Uh, whoops. Grab this one and paste that in there. Um, and when it asks us this, um, if you change the IP address of a server and you try to connect to the same machine uh, with the same SSH key, um, there's this fingerprint here and it says, are you sure you want to continue connecting? You just type yes. It just um, basically the IP address is different than what your system is expecting. And you just, but you're, that's what you're expecting too. So anyway, so now that we're logged in, we can say tmux attach. And now we're back into the session that we had from before. So this is really handy, um, this feature of Tmux. If your internet connection drops, um, your session will still keep running. So your, our server is still running, for example. So that's good. Um, if our browser crashed, if we were running this through this connect, um, this connect button, I do this and I um, have to come back here. If I were to connect this way and our browser crashes, whatever was running in that window um, is gone now. So. Uh, okay, so where were we? So back in Bubble, we want to take our new uh, static IP address. Oh, there's one other step. I'm not going to do this now, but um, what you're going to do typically in production is now that you've got a static IP address for your server, is you would map a domain name to this IP address. So, like, you know, say your website is mysite.com, you would say use api.mysite.com and map that to this static IP address so that when somebody tries to make a request to your API, they use the domain name instead of your IP address. Um, but that's kind of, that's a different thing that we don't have time for, I think, right now. So, um, so let's just take the server address. That's fine, too. And it's going to be HTTP. It's not HTTPS. Um, the other thing is you're typically not mapping, um, well, I'm not sure how to say this. So typically what you would do in production is you would set up an, a proper web server like Nginx or Apache. And behind that server, you would have your this API server running, like your fast API server. And so incoming requests would talk to fast API, or sorry, would talk to your web server like Nginx. 
and then nginx functions as something called a reverse proxy so um, nginx takes the request and it sends it to fast api and it gets a response back and then nginx sends the response back to uh, the client so say the browser of the user um, in this case we're going to not have nginx or apache in the middle and we're just going to connect directly to this to our uvicorn server which is fine for development but again if you're doing this in production this is um, not best practice anyway so if we call this endpoint now we should be able to get a response from our server uh, if we've set things up oh we still haven't opened our port so that's the next step so this will just hang forever um, so what we want to do now is we want to go open port 8000 um, if you recall here that's that's the port that it's running on it tells us here that it's running on um, this just means local host um, 8000 and so there's actually another thing I forgot. So um, you need to write host uh, 0.0.0.0. .0 .0. So what this means is um, when it's running like this, um, it's accessible to this, this local machine. And so if you had Nginx running, for example, Nginx could make a request to your API server, um, but external services could not. In this case, because we don't have a web server in between, we want to talk directly to this program. And so this will say, let requests from the outside world come into this server. So this, this is like internet shorthand for any IP address in the world. Um, so that's, we're going to run it like that. Um, and then we're going to come back here. So this is our instance view again. And so we select our instance and then we come down to security and we've got this security group here. And it tells us what, so, so this, here's that same shorthand, 0, 0, 0. This means um, let any computer in the world connect via SSH on port 22 um, if they have the key. What we want to do here is add a rule that says open up port 8000 for any source. So the way you do that is you click on the security group name and you'll get this. And you want to say edit inbound rules. And the rule that we want to modify is custom TCP. Uh, no, I don't want to edit that one, actually. That was a mistake. Um, I wanted to add a new one. So you say add rule, and custom TCP by default is selected. You want to say just port 8000, and then the source is this one here. So we save rules. So now port 8000 is open to the world. Um, so if we come back here, uh, this is still not doing anything. So we'll just refresh the page. And once this reloads, we should be able to get back that uh, hello folks call uh, from here. So if we do this, we would call this you know, root get or something. Um, if we click initialize call, if we've done everything correctly, which it doesn't appear that we have, um, we should be able to get a response back. But we're missing something. I think we need to add the port name in the URL. Oh, yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's what we're missing. Yeah, thank you very much. So now, if probably have to reload again, make sure that we've got the right URL here, and the right uh, IP address. So Vishal, did you used to work in IT by chance, just using Linux and knowing about ports and stuff? Like I worked in cybersecurity for like before before this no no code, doing no code. Okay, cool. Um, that's one of my one of the interests. And you, one of the, and, one, and, and you need to remove the HTTP, so it it will not load the port eighty of the HTTP. Yeah. You think? Yeah, I think it will be helpful. Yeah, now check the thing. Yeah. Oh, this is, um, let's try. So it says it's not a valid URL. Um, let's try it this way. So that's not working either. Uh, let's see. Uh, can you check that on Insomnia if it's working? Uh, I could. Um, yeah. Let's do that. Um, So it's open port 8000. Uh, it's a get request host 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. Let's see. 
uh, let's say, oops. So here we'll click new request, we'll say fast API demo. And we'll grab this. Yeah, it shows it's not um, it's not getting through here, so I'm missing some. I think maybe the port's not open. Yeah, the port's not open. Not sure why. Maybe I didn't click save. I thought I did. No, there it is. Um, strange. Maybe I have the wrong wrong IP address. So 18.189.173. Yeah, I have the wrong IP address. So this should work now. I think. Oh, it's not running anymore. Aha, now all the pieces have come together. <laughs> OK, there we go. Uh, so let's do that again. So we connect, and we can see here that there's a request coming from here, um, which is the bubble server. And here's our response. So we have, hello, folks. And we can click Save. And so now we can use this in our bubble app. Um, or we can, of course, modify this. And it'll reload. And we can reinitialize. And now it says, hello, world. OK. Um, OK, so that was kind of. Uh, a bit of a mess at the end. Do you guys have any questions there? Or does that all kind of make sense? It's clear to me. Yeah. It's clear. Okay. Um, so it's two, or it's two o'clock here anyway. Um, we could look next at the workflow API if you want. Um, so basically going in the other direction, um, or we can call it a day, depending on what you feel like. Also, what are the use cases you find for the fast API? Yeah, um, so why don't I quickly do the workflow part of, of yeah, this? Yeah, sure, works, works. Yeah, OK. Um, so let's get out of this. Uh, where are we? OK, so then if we wanted to um, expose this, um, this uh, the workflow API. What we can do is check this box, and this will allow, if we use this URL, we'll be able to call into our bubble app and trigger some workflow. So that's what this um, WF stands for. So what we could do is set up a simple workflow, a backend workflow, that um, we can trigger either from Insomnia or from, we could trigger it from here or wherever, and do something in our bubble app. So. So what we'll do is we'll come to workflows and backend workflows, and we'll create um, a new API workflow. We'll call it uh, fast API test. And we want it to be public so that external services can call in. Um, if you, if, so typically, um, you don't want to check this. Um, if you're exposing something externally, you want to generate an API key. Um, so you come here, generate a new API token here. So you could say like fast API demo, and then you would pass this private key as an authorization header, um, as a like you'd have bearer. Um, we can I guess we can do this from Insomnia easily enough. So we'll do that. We'll leave that on. That's best practice. Um, and so then you don't have to check this box. If you leave it unchecked, any any service can call your workflow. So that could be dangerous. Um, same idea here. So if you're protecting your data with um, privacy rules, which you should be, um, you probably don't want to check this box. OK, so then we can say trigger the workflow with either a post or a get. Um, we'll leave it as post. And then we can either say detect request data. And then this, what this will do is it will allow us to send um, from whatever service or webhook, we can send a test event, and Bubble will capture um, our dummy data. Um, or capture whatever test data. So I'll show you what that could look like. Um, so let's do this. Let's bring this out of the way for now, and we'll close this up. So what we'll do is we'll say, um, get this out of the way. We'll say test bubble backend workflow. 
and it will be a post and the body will be JSON. So we'll say create. Um, and now what we want to do is take this URL, paste it in here, and we want to send some dummy data to the bubble. So like test data. And if we run this, it should this should show that it's detected our data, um, but it's not authorized. Right. That's why we set up the authorization token. So we want to say uh, here, we want a bearer token. So by default, um, it'll be bearer and then whatever our API key is. So we don't have to set it here explicitly. Um, so let's get out of this for a second. We'll come back to here. We'll grab our API key here. Um, and we'll paste it here without the copy part. And now we should be able to send it over. So we'll come back here, we'll click detect data and we will click send. Um, still unauthorized. Oh, right, that's because we're not on a paid plan. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, do, um, <laughs> I'm gonna do a little bit of a hack here. Um, hopefully Bubble doesn't get mad at me. Um, so this app is on a free plan, which doesn't expose um, backend workflow APIs, I guess. So if we change this to agency and confirm change, then I get access to everything, um, which is great, but this will be temporary. So don't be mad, Bubble. Um, and then now we should be able to do the same thing. Um, so we click send and with a bit of luck, it comes through. Okay, so now we have um, this test data, um, which is coming directly from this, right? Um, so that's, you know, that's useful for getting things set up, but it doesn't really, um, doesn't really do anything in the wild. So what we could do instead is if we move this out of the way, what we could do, um, this is a pretty artificial example, but what we could do is we could set up a function, um, set up an endpoint. Hello, Joshua, 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 welcome. Um, hey, thanks. Um, we're just in the process of um, wiring up a fast API server to a bubble app. Um, if, so if you have any questions, um, feel free to, to jump in. Um, but uh, what we we're going to look at now is um, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to, in this get method, which is what we're calling here, we'll, in this method, we'll call our bubble um, backend workflow. So this, you know, again, this isn't typically what you would do. You typically wouldn't make a request to an endpoint that then calls back to a different workflow, but just for the sake of simplicity, um, we can see what it would look like. Um, so in Python, the easiest way to make HTTP requests is with the Python requests module. Um, so I wanted to, not that. Um, so this just lets you make get and post requests. Um, this might be fine. In the same way that we were setting get and post requests in here, um, the requests library lets us do that from Python. So we, to use it, uh, let's get this out of the way. Um, we would import the library and then we make a call um, and then we get some data back. So what we'll do is we'll say uh, import requests in our server and then we'll copy this line here and the request that we want to make, we'll put this down here. So before we return a response to bubble, um, we want to get some URL. So we'll just pull this out for the, for the moment. Um, this is going to be our bubble workflow URL. So we'll say set bubble workflow URL. And then our authentication in this case is going to be our bearer token. Um, so I don't know offhand if this will work, but we'll try. Um, so we want to pass that API key that we set up, um, whatever it is, we'll set that in a second. Um, and what we can do in Python um, is we can use something called an F string. So if you do F and then um, these quotes, you can type some string, so like name, whatever, and then in curly brackets, you can put the name of a variable. So like our API key, for example. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, um, we're going to make an F string here. And we're going to say bearer and then inside here uh, we'll paste our bubble api key we'll, um, it'll fill it in for us when it runs um, so we'll say bubble api key and then we need to close that 
And so this, um, this might work, <laughs> we'll find out. Um, so we'll grab, we'll come back and we will come back to our workflow. And so when we click initialize, um, or detect data rather, it gives us this initialize URL. And so we can paste that in here for now. Um, and then after you set it up, you typically take this initialize word off. Well, not typically, you, you wanna take the initialize word off because this is only valid while you're uh, specifically detecting data. So if we delete this, um, you could say bubble workflow URL, let's say. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then we want to set our token. Now, again, this is not best practice. You would not write this in your code. What you would typically do is you'd um, probably set it as an environment variable. So you'd say import OS so that you can read from your operating system. And then your key would be like, um, just a second here, I'm trying to get rid of that highlighting. You'd say that your key is os.environ to read an environment variable. And you'd say like bubble API key. Um, I guess I can show you how you would do that. So the simple way to hard code it, I'll show you both ways, I guess. Um, so if we hard code it, we just put it here. Um, I guess I can grab that from here. So it's, this is our token. So we could say, um, there's our bubble API key. Um, we'll run it like this and then I'll change it in a minute. Um, so then that gets put into this for our auth field. Here's our URL. Um, we're not passing any data. Um, and we're triggering this with a post. So um, if we change this to get, then this will work because the, the method that we're setting here is dot get. Um, if we want to set it to dot post, we do this, change this to dot, or change this to post. Um, so let's leave it like that. Uh, and then to pass a body, I believe you pass data equals data. Um, so if we search for post, um, it's not here. We'd have to go to the docs, uh, which we usually want to do anyway. Let me see here. Um, where is the documentation? Here it is. And then here we can search for post. It might be on this page. Uh, yeah. This might be unnecessary, but um, yeah, data equals whatever. So here they're setting this payload. Um, we can use this, I guess, in the next step. Um, so we might as well do this. So if we wanna make a post request, we can send JSON data, which is handy uh, a lot of the time. So we'll take this payload example and we'll come back to our server and we'll set payload equals this, just dummy data. And then we'll say data equals payload. And if we've wired this all up correctly, um, we should be able to make a GET request to this uh, server. And that will then make a secondary call back into our bubble workflow API. So let's see if we've done this correctly. Um, if we, our server, oh, it's okay. So it says, when I save the file, um, we get this error that there's no module named requests. That's easy enough to fix. We just close our server and say pip3 install requests and then restart our server. And then um, we, so one thing to note, uh, if we want to auto detect our data, we have to have this running. Um, so you can, in Chrome, I think in Firefox too, you can, um, you can right click your bubble tab and click duplicate. And you get another tab um, at the same place in your app, which is quite handy. Um, okay, so we want to come to plugins, an API connector here. And we'll bring up our call again. So if we've done everything correctly, then when we click this, we'll see it over here. Uh, it did not work. So string object is not callable. Um, okay, so this, I guess, needs to be um, formatted differently. So this auth, so um, we want to change this uh, auth object, this authentication object, um, to whatever its format is supposed to be. I don't know offhand. Uh, so let's just look for auth. 
Uh, it might just be a header, but we'll see. Um, here we go. So we don't want basic auth. Let's look for bearer. Uh, that didn't return anything. Um, hmm. Okay, well, there's two options, I guess, here. One is maybe this has to be a JSON object. Um, so I'll try this like so. Uh, yeah, I think it has to say auth. Uh, let's do this. I think it has to say authorization like this. And then bearer and then our key. I think this is the right um, syntax. And if not, then we'll, there's other things we can try. Um, so let's try that. Let's see if that works. So nope, not a dictionary object. What if we send it a tuple? Oops. Uh, this one, invalid syntax. No. Pardon the debugging on the fly here. Um, okay, so that's wrong. So maybe it has to be a string. Oh, jar. Let's see. Um, we could just go to Stack Overflow. Um, so fast API, bearer token. All right, sorry, this is requests. requests. Uh, Oh, it just has to be a header object. Okay, that's fine. Um, that was one of the hypotheses. So we'll say headers equals, and then we want to take all of this. Um, and so that's now an object, a Python object. Um, and then we'll just pass it here as a header. So we'll say headers equals headers, I think. Let's see if this works. Um, this appears that it should work. All right, sweet. So that worked. Um, so now we get hello world. Um, and we have a back end workflow that wasn't detecting any data, or was it? Did we actually call this? Let's try again. So we initialize. Hmm. Oh, I took the initialize out and didn't put it back in. That's why. Try again. So now we reinitialize. Does it come through? No, it doesn't. Hmm. What are we missing here? So it's definitely hitting the endpoint. We're saying. Um, Getting a response back. But why is it not? Hmm. You guys see anything that I'm missing here? So this should be our URL. Let's do this. Um, this slash initialize. So this looks right. Um, what we could do is um, oh, there we go. Not sure why that took a minute. Um, but anyway, so now we have key one, key two values. So this is dummy data, of course. Um, so if we were if we were doing some kind of computation on the server, then we can return some data back, which is useful, right? So let's do this. Let's say um, there's this library in Python called UUID, uh, which generates unique identifiers. So this is good for identifying files or something. Um, so what we could do 
um, is we could create a little API that all it does is stick a, a new UUID in our database um, with a particular email address. So let's set that up. So what we could do, this will get a little bit more complicated. So what we could do is we could say, um, this, this root now takes a parameter. So we're gonna let it take an email address and it's going to generate a UUID and send into our workflow that email address and that unique identifier and then save that in the database. So let's look at what that would look like. So if you define um, arguments or um, parameters here in this function, um, then you can pass them as part of your API call. So let's say email and it will be a string. Uh, you don't need this string annotation here, but we'll keep it in. Um, a type hint, it's called. And for now, let's make this a bit bigger. Um, what I'm going to do is make this full screen so we can see a bit better. So <clears throat> we're going to take this email, and then when we, when we send our payload to our, um, our backend workflow, we'll pass this email value as the first value. And our value here is going to be our UUID that we generate. So let's just say um, new UUID. So we'll generate a UUID by saying, um, here, let's just do this. Let's say um, identifier, just so it's not confusing. Let's say identifier is equal to UUID dot UUID four. Um, so this is, this is the, the module or the package. Uh, and then UUID four is a method on that. Um, so I can show you, if you open up Python and you say import UUID, then you say UUID.UUID4, and then parentheses, you get these unique identifiers. So basically what we want to do is send this, one of these values back with the email address. Um, so, and note that it shows here this in caps, this UUID thing. This is the class or the type. Um, so we want to convert this to a string. Um, so we're going to pass this string. Uh, as the second value. So we'll call it UUID is the name of the, the field. And then here we'll say um, identifier. Uh, identifier. So what's going to happen now is we're going to get the, UR, uh, the email coming in through our get request. And then it's going to pair that with this UUID that we just created and send that to our backend workflow. And so right now it's not configured to do anything, our backend workflow but we can change that. So if we come back to bubble and when this runs, we want to say, um, let's say, well, first we need to get the data types. So we'll initialize it to get these two values and then we'll modify it. So we say detect data again. And if this has been saved, we can close this here. Um, we should be able to run this. Um, what am I missing? Oh, right, I didn't add the parameter. So we want to add the email parameter here um, to pass over. We'll just say test at test.com. And then if we initialize it, come back over here, we can see now we have uh, an email, which is wrong, and an UUID. So what we missed, so I'm going to close Insomnia. I set the field incorrectly here. So I set the email and the UUID to be the same value. So that's just a mistake. So the email will be the email that's coming in here. So we reload, we'll do it again. So detect and then um, initialize again. So there's hello world. And then now we see we're getting email and UUID. So if we click save, then now this um, backend workflow has these two parameters. And so what we can do is we can say, create a new thing in our database. So we don't have a data type. So let's just say um, best API user or something. And it'll have an email field, which is a string or text. And it will have a UUID field, which is also a text. And when we trigger this event, what we want to do is create a new thing in our database of that kind. We want to set its email to the request data's email and the UUID to the request data's UUID. So now what should happen um, is when we, so what we can do now, uh, first of all, is um, we don't want to send it to the initialize endpoint anymore. We want to send it to the active endpoint. So we come here and we remo remove that initialize word. And now whenever we call this uh, API, what, what it should do is set an object like this in the database that has just has our uh, whatever email we're passing 
and then a random identifier. So let's say here, um, email will be newtest.com. And I'll open one more tab here. Um, I often have, just as a note, three tabs open for Bubble. I have one for the database, one for the workflows, and one for the designer um, or the front end stuff. So if we come to our app data, we can see all of our fast API users. There's nothing here right now. Um, let me close this. So now we shouldn't have to go into this anymore. We can just trigger it from here um, and it should create a new entry in our database. So there's new test, you can say test two. Um, and this, generally you don't want this to be private if you're setting it from inside your app, but um, it's not really relevant for right now. So now we should have three records in our database, which we do, that all have a unique identifier and they have whatever email we sent over. So this, um, this is how you can use the, the workflow API to interact with your database. Um, but you could do whatever, right? So you could modify data. You could um, you could change something. Uh, you can't really you can't easily modify things on the page that the user is looking at. Um, you can by setting stuff in the database and then having stuff on the page pay attention to stuff in the database. But um, um, yeah. So yeah. So that's how that works. Uh, you guys have any questions? Clear to me. Sorry. Yeah. You clear to me. You said creative? It's clear to me, like I can understand what you mean. Yeah. Okay, okay, it's clear. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's the goal. Um, so, yeah, so we're getting up to an hour and a half. Um, I don't think, um, I mean, we could look at the, we could look really quickly at the data API, I guess, um, if you want to. I don't know how you guys feel, yeah. um, but we could look quickly at, um, it's easier to understand um, just how to get data out of the database than it is to put it in. Um, so we'll look at that and then we'll leave the posting data to the database as an exercise. Um, McHenry or um, I'm not sure how to say your name, Klein, is it Yahashua? Uh, it's Shua, aka Wild Oh, it's Shua. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> yeah, no, it's my full name. It's confusing. Uh, um, yeah, sorry. But, yeah. yeah. Long time, no talk. Yeah, but this, this is super clear to me. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, well, welcome. Um, okay, so why don't we spend 10 minutes, look at the data API, and then uh, call it a day. So um, if we, uh, okay, so if we want to use the data API, um, we come into settings, and just like with the workflow API, you have to enable it. So we'll enable it, and it'll give us this privacy warning, you know, take care of your data. Um, we'll turn it on for a fast API user. Now, something that's helpful to know um, if you're just getting started with this is um, this Swagger API documentation access. This is something that you get for free, which is really nice. Uh, it's like an open standard for defining how APIs are built. Um, so I'll bring up the docs real quick. Um, the swapper is not the right word. Um, so Swagger, and here it is. So it's, um, yeah, it's an open API specification. So what you can get from Bubble is um, basically a breakdown of how your API is built. So what I'm gonna do, um, I believe to get your file, you take this and then I think it's um, swagger.json. Maybe it's object slash swagger.json. Uh, no. Okay, so we'll find it in the manual. I don't remember the URL offhand. Um, the reason that this is important is if you leave it on, um, well, there's different reasons there. It's meta, that's why. Um, you take this URL here and paste it into your browser. And you'll see this is, this is our API. So we've got a workflow. Um, so here's, so what do we want to see? Um, uh, so this is, I think this is just saying we have a workflow API and a data API, but it's not telling us, um, not telling us much beyond that. Um, so I thought it would show us our data types if um, use field display instead of ID. Um, interesting. So I don't know. 
well, we'll come, maybe we'll come back to this later um, because I have seen quite long uh, Swagger um, files or specifications where um, you can see all of your data types that you've exposed. And so uh, typically you'll wanna check this so that it's hidden. So now if we try to refresh this page, we can't see it. Um, I guess it's probably cached in my browser, but um, if I took it into another browser, then probably I can't load that file. So just as a security thing, um, I tend to leave it hidden, and then when I'm working on it, I'll I'll enable it. Um, Sorry, but, you're showing the default on on default domain. That data you're oh, showing. Oh right, yeah, right. That's not that's never gonna work. <laughs> You need, to, you need to replace the app name, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, I need to change my app name, that's right. Uh, what do I call it, Fast API Demo? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> that's a, thank you for that. Um, here we go. Um, perfect, okay, so, so now, um, but why is it available? That's an interesting, I thought I made it hidden. Maybe it takes a minute to, to hide, I'm not really sure. But in any case, it's not really the point. Um, so let's go to the manual and look at the data API uh, docs. So if you come to manual.bubble.io, type uh, data API, I get this. Um, and so here's the general endpoint. So whatever your app name is, and then whatever, um, so, so this stays object, and then type name you replace with whatever you want to see, right? So what we could do uh, is open Insomnia Backup and just call directly into our, um, our database. The, if we wanted to do it from code, we would just basically follow the same structure as we used for the workflow API, just with a different URL. Um, let's say um, query bubble data API. Um, and I believe it's a post that it wants, I'm not sure. Create a new thing as a post, and yeah, probably uh, retrieve, so general data. So we want to get um, a list of things. I think if we send this as a get, um, which is the base URL, I think we just get, um, so we get the first hundred items in the list. So if I'm remembering correctly, uh, we'll get these three, these three users here. So let's come back here. And the type, what do I call it? Fast API user. Uh, so data type should be, um, and I think, uh, I don't remember offhand if it down cases it for you, um, does not expose a data API. That's interesting. I'm sure you need to change the app name, this one. I uh, used app name again, that's fine, yeah. Um, uh, fast API demo, is that the name of the app? I believe it is. Okay, is it disabled maybe? I thought it was enabled. Let's just take it from here. And then type not found. So if I change, uh, how did I spell this? Fast API user. Uh, this is where the Swagger documentation would come in handy, potentially. Um, but it doesn't seem to be showing us anyway. Um, so maybe not. Um, Oh, maybe I need to. Uh, Sometimes there's a problem with spaces. I've had yes. that experience. Yeah, so let's try if we URL encode this. There we go. Thank you for that, Shiva. Um, so if you're um, if you have a space in your um, your field, so percent you can replace it with percent twenty, which is the HTML code for space. Um, and so now we get our results. So it shows us here we get three back. Um, here's the UUID field. Here's the unique ID from Bubble. Um, 
and then the email address that it's associated with. So, so this is good um, if you need to get data out. So like, for example, if you wanted to pull a bunch of records out of your database and then do something and then send data back, you could do that. Um, so why don't we try as an exercise um, to, we'll pull up, pull, we'll have a separate endpoint uh, in our bubble um, we'll, we'll make a separate endpoint in our fast API server that we can call and what it'll do is pull down these records and it will change all of the UUIDs to be um, some random number between one and 10 or something, or something arbitrary. Um, so that should be pretty quick. So we'll say um, app dot could make it a post and then make the route be um, say, I don't know, modify, say mod users. So that'll be um, the name, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the URL, the end of the URL that we want to specify. And we need to define a method. And so we'll call it, this can be anything, um, but we'll just call it the same thing, call it mod users. And it won't take any parameters for now. And then we're going to want to set, set our, um, our bubble data API. So, sorry, bubble data URL, data API URL. So we can just call this URL for short. And we want to use that same URL we had here. Um, so we'll paste that in here. Now, what you could do um, is if you're going to modify a specific type, um, you can just hard code it here if you have an endpoint dedicated to a specific data type. Um, and if you wanted to make this variable, um, you, could, you could do it in a couple of different ways. So I think a path parameter in, um, in a fast API is defined like this. So you can say like type, um, I don't know for sure. Um, I could double check in a second, or you could pass it here. You could say type and then make this a string and then replace it here. Um, if you pass it in here, um, same, you can access it the same way. So um, then here you would say type like this. Um, this could be worth checking, I guess. <clears throat> so if we do, I'll delete this. If we pass the type there, um, let's bring up the docs real quick for fast API. Uh, is it here? No, here. Um, path parameter, oh, it's in curly brackets. Um, oh, here, here, by the way, this is Swagger JSON. Or, yeah, so this is the Swagger UI. Um, this is what it looks like sort of when it's printed nicely. This is the same thing that Bubble is using. Um, so, oh, actually, that's kind of interesting. What we could do is we could bring up our own Swagger JSON, um, our, our, our own pretty printed Swagger specification for fun. Um, so if we were to go to our server URL um, slash docs, then by default, I believe it's turned on. Um, whoops. So we should be able to say this slash docs, uh, port 8,000 first. Yeah, there we go. And so here's our read root method. It shows us, it takes this email parameter. Um, so again, typically you want to hide this in production um, so that people can't just see oh, what, what are all the different routes that your API exposes. Um, but if I save this now, so this, this endpoint's not done yet, but if I save it and I reload this page, um, now we have this mod users post function too. You can also use this to test, right? So you can say like, I want to post some data in here. Um, so like in here, um, I don't know why it's not allowing me to add a query parameter here, but anyway, um, useful to know. So let's come back to here. Um, so it looks like from these documents, from this documentation here, that we want to pass it as a curly bracket. Yeah, here it is. So this is what we're trying to get. So this item ID art is going to be our type. So, um, and then you tell it in here um, that item ID from the path, you want to treat it as an integer, uh, and then it uses it here. So what we'll do is replace this like this. So we could say um, type is a tricky word. It's, I believe um, in here it's probably fine, but if you type type in Python, it's a reserved keyword. So I'd probably want to avoid that. So I'd call it like data type or something. Whoops. Call it like uh, data type. And then in here, we'll say data type. 
and say that it's a string like so. Um, and then we'll put it here in our thing. And so now um, this would be sort of type general. So like anytime you wanted to get data from your API of whatever kind, you would just have to pass as a path parameter, the data type. Um, so let's say return, um, well, first we need to make our request, I guess. Um, so we need this headers thing. Um, so I guess uh, what I'll quickly do is show you how you can use it this way as a separate, um, as a sort of more secure way to do this. So we'll set our API key in the environment instead of hard coded in our, um, in our code. So what we'll do, yeah, this will be fine. Um, if we, there's a few different ways that you can do this. One way you can do it is just write it when you launch your server. You can say like bubble API key equals and then paste it in here. That's one thing you can do. It's not super secure because then it's in your shell history if somebody gets into your server. But um, typically you'd have an environment file and you would use that to load your, your, your secrets and your keys and stuff. But for now, we'll just do it this way. This is better than having it in your code for sure. Um, so our key is this. And so something we can do as a test is we can say, you wouldn't do this, of course, but our security key is, and then we'll pass in our key. Um, so we'll say, we'll load it before our method. Maybe we want it in all of our different, um, different routes. So we'll say bubble API key is this, and then we'll say um, that should work. And let's see, now if we reload, if we run it now with our key here, um, it shows us now our security key is this. So now it doesn't have to be in our code, so that's good. Um, so then you would, this is now duplicating um, this one. So we'll delete that one here. And yeah, you would delete this as well. Okay, so that's good. And then, um, so what do we want to do? So we want to grab all of the user, the um, fast API users. So that'll be our response. So we, um, or that'll be our request, I guess. So here's our URL. So we'll change this to say URL and data is payload. We don't have, um, we're not going to post to this endpoint. So um, we're going to, this is going to be a get. So this has to be get. And so we don't need this payload, but we still need our headers. And so then we could print our dot JSON. So we're going to get JSON back. Um, and then we could return it as well if we wanted to um, as a test. So if this is working, we should be able to make a test post call to this URL slash mod user slash fast API user and just get back um, the data that we saw in Insomnia. Um, so let's try that. So here, what we're doing, so this is basically just replacing a direct call to our database, and then we'll add some logic in here, right? We're basically just duplicating this Insomnia setup for now. But um, so now what we can do is we can replace that with our, um, with our server IP address, which is this. And we can say that this is a post request now, I believe we said it. Um, yeah, this is a post. And we want to say uh, get or mod users and then um, fast, let me say fast API percent 20 user, I think. So if this is set up correctly, we should see the same exact same data, um, but we did not. So something's wrong. Let's see, JSON is not defined. That's easy to fix. Uh, it's just the JSON package. So we say, import JSON, and then it reloads. I'll try again. There's another error, as there usually is. Um, type error, get set descriptor object is not iterable. So I'm not sure what this is. Let's see. Um, data equals this. Oh, we didn't pass any. Um, I think what's going on is we didn't pass a post body. Um, let me see. So we post to here, data type. Oh, we didn't pass. Um, no, that's not right. 
if you guys see anything, uh, please feel free to um, chime in. Um, mod users, fast API user. Um, is it related to the request dot get? What's that? Sorry. The function you are calling request dot get. It should be like uh, request dot post, right? Um, I can't. Uh, sorry, I can't hear. Um, the the next line to the header that you are using uh, request dot get function. This it one? should be post uh, or it should be get. Should be. What what is the function? It should be get of post. It should be get or post. This should be get because this is going to the bubble um, backend. So let's try this. Um, I'm going to try this hard coded for a second um, and see if it's that. So I do we call it? I just want to double check that I've got the right name here. Oh, okay, so it's the wrong. That could be what's going on. Um, try that first, I guess. So this is, I don't know if this is case sensitive offhand, but let's try this. Um, no, it's not that. So if we, it could be the way that it's unpacking this data type um, parameter is wrong. So this would be the place to check that. Uh, get int, I'm typing. I don't see this being a problem, but let's try. Um, let's say fast API, actually 20 user. And then this will comment out and this, um, actually this doesn't need to be here. This needs to be here. So this, let's see if this works just hard coded. Um, let me get rid of this. Okay, well that's, we're getting somewhere. Um, so mod users, um, saying a parameter is missing. Oh, because, no. Um, so we're calling this fast API user. Okay. Um, hmm. What's this? I doubt it. But try. So it's saying field required. Um, oh, this is what it's asking for. So we got a field defined in here and it's empty. Uh, I guess that's not good. That makes sense. And then we're getting the same error. Okay, so where is this coming from? Um, hmm. So we're getting temporary redirect. Okay, so we're getting a 200 from bubble, I think. Um, so that's good. So we're posting to this bound method response.json and response. Um, oh, I think, I think what I'm doing wrong is this JSON is supposed to be a method call and not a property. Oh, or no, actually it could be that this is returning the JSON package instead of the, so I don't know actually offhand if this is a property or a method, but I'm pretty sure this is where the mistake is. Um, so I'm going to do this. Well, I'll do that in a second. Pretty sure that was the mistake. Um, yeah. Okay. So if we undo all those commented lines and make that dynamic again, um, we should be good to go. Just adding that r.json here. And then here we want to pass the type again. Okay, perfect. Uh, it's not returning um, 
as we expect, but it is calling it without issue. So return rfjson. Uh, yeah, right, it's a method, so it does need to be called. Um, and then that should be the last bit for that. Um, okay, there we go. So there's our data. So we were just missing this call to say turn the request, the or sorry, the response um, into JSON data. Okay, so now that we've gotten our data, um, what we could do is um, modify it. So this gets a, um, a little bit tricky, but we could say like, we could write a separate function or we could write a little loop. We could say like for each item in our JSON, um, uh, we want to update it. I don't think I'm going to go through that right now, um, but we could, we'll see. I could start it real quick. Um, what you would do is you want to modify a thing by ID. So we want to make this patch request. Um, so if we have a unique ID, um, then uh, which this, uh, we want to get this ID field here, right? So what we could do, um, let's try, I guess, why not? Um, let's say, um, so what's the best way to do this? Um, well, first of all, let's say um, JSON data equals r.json, and then we'll say for uh, it's what is it in? It's in our results. So this results coming back is a list. So what we could do is say um, for um, I don't know record in JSON data uh, results, and that'll give us um, one of these things. Uh, we want to print out this underscore ID, this unique ID. We just say print. Um, record ID and get rid of this for now. And what we'll do next is we'll say patch to change um, the UUID field to something random. So we'll leave that there for now. So if we call this now from Insomnia, we have an error, key error results. So for record in JSON data dot results. Okay, so I've got this data structure incorrect, I guess. So what I'll do is I'll comment this out for a second and then send it again and see. Um, so we get response and then results. So I guess it needs to be um, JSON data um, response results, I think. So that will give us the list of records, hopefully. Okay, so it worked. And then if we come to our server, we can see here's the unique IDs. Okay, so that's good. So now we know the unique ID for each of those records. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take this. So we just need to make a patch request. So this is pretty straightforward. We already have um, the type name. So we already have the URL that we need. Um, and then we just need to append the unique ID for that object to the end of our next call. So what we'll, and then we want to send, um, we want to update whatever. Um, so we might have to modify this setting here um, under the privacy rules, but we'll try it before changing it. Um, where was I? Right here. So if we say, um, so now that we have that, we want to say for each record, we're going to make a a patch request and our, it's going to be our URL plus whatever the unique ID is. So we'll say ID equals um, record ID and you might say instead something like um, processing record and then whatever your ID is. Make this an app string and then so we'll say um, our URL, sort of our base URL, um, and then a slash, and then our ID. And so this should give us our composed URL, com the base plus the unique ID. And if we patch to that, um, and then our we need to send some data that we want to modify. 
So down here we said, um, uh, where was it? Our data equals payload, and our payload was like this. It's the same basic idea. So we'll take this and we'll say, uh, we'll get rid of the email. So we're not gonna change that. We'll say the unique identifier is, and then whatever. So like, um, so we could say, I don't know, we'll um, just do a number. We'll say import random, and then we'll say um, number, we'll just say num equals random dot rand. Int. Let's take a random integer um, up to 10,000. So I don't know when this would ever be useful, but um, we say import random, random dot rand int, and we say a number. This is, um, yeah, I was checking if we need to start. So we need to start and an end for a range. So it's like any number between these two values, any integer. And so we can do that. So we'll say between one and 999, say 9,000 for the mean points. Uh, and then close this. So that'll be our number. And that's what we'll stick in the UUID field. Um, does this all make sense to everybody? Uh, any questions before I go further? Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm confused about the payload. So okay. is that like always going to be the body or did you define that somewhere? So that's um, not defined yet. Um, so that's in our request call, like when we set up our request here, um, if you're setting oh, okay. a post or a patch, then one of the parameters you want to set is your data, which is just your body. And so we say data equals payload. Um, so like we could call this data or we could call it body or whatever. So we could say like data equals body. Um, okay. and it that makes just, sense. Has to, just has to be a Python object. Um, so we'll do it like that. Um, you know, in reality, you'd want these to be the same so you don't confuse people, but um, whatever. So we'll do that. Uh, data equals body and set our values to some number there. Um, so if we wire this up, we're going to, we're going to get our data back. Um, so you might, we've got two R's now, so you might want to say like R1 and R2 or something, um, but not strictly necessary because it, it, it'll work fine, I think, without changing this, but we'll say R2 equals this. Um, and then you could like print R2 dot status or something if you want to see if it worked or not. And then typically you'd say like try, um, you would try this and then if it failed, like accept um, exception uh, as e print e or something like this. Um, you, you know, and this says like try it and if it fails, then you know, do something, write it to the log, um, logging.info or whatever. So you can do like that. Um, this is getting a bit unnecessarily verbose, but whatever. Uh, and then, and then you print r2.status. So, um, yeah, so let's try that. So we'll call this, we'll get our data down, and then we'll iterate over all of our results. We'll pull out the ID. Um, looks like ID is a reserved keyword. I did not know that. Um, So let's say underscore ID, um, and then it might not be, but um, we'll do that. And then we'll say underscore ID and see if this works. So now if we call this, it's going to proxy to the bubble data API um, to get some data, and then it's gonna make three calls, hopefully to the data API to update three values, um, but it failed. <laughs> Uh, key error ID, right? So that's wrong. That makes sense um, because it's not record ID. It's record underscore ID. Try again. Uh, by the way, it's typically good practice to return your error here. So what, that's what we should be doing. This would help us debug faster. So let's say if there's an exception, why don't we return E? Um, you might have to do like json.load dumps E or something. Would you also add the uh, underscore to the print uh, print function? Processing required. And this here. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, so let's try again. Uh, did not send back our, we didn't return our error. Let's 
strange. Um, oh, it's a different error. Uh, R2.status. So it succeeded. <laughs> so this should be in here. Um, whoops. That's why. Um, so we have this print statement, but really what we should have in here is a return statement. Um, then we would say like something, you would typically make um, your own response object. So you'd say like um, status is r2.status and then message would be like r2.text or something. Um, or you could just write a message that says um, updated bubble data or something. Uh, now, I think it worked though, so our data is going to be um, changed. So let's double check. Uh, so this one worked, and then the loop failed. Um, so let's try that again. Let's see if we run it again now, if it does all three. Nope. Object, not JSON serializable. Um, R2.status. Got the wrong field name. Uh, it might need to be. Um, I'm gonna just do this manually. Um, there is a property on it <clears throat> uh, that we can use. Status code lookup. Um, maybe it's status code. Yeah, status code. Um, that's why. So. Let's do it that way, r2 status code, and try again, sweet. So status 204, um, so it's good we didn't return a 200 um, because it's not really the right, um, in some sense the 200 is correct because our API is returning a 200, but the 204 is from bubble saying that we successfully updated our data. So um, we refresh this now then it's only working on one of them though. That's interesting. Um, so something wrong with the loop here for record and the results. Um, oh, I see. It's, uh, we're not supposed to return for each record. That's why. So, um, well, hmm, that's tricky. So what we would do is not return here and then we would return here. Um, after we've looped through all our records. So we do want to throw an exception if there's a problem, but um, we don't then have this R2 status code. So we want, want to say 200 here. So I suppose a form, an informative error, um, hopefully. Do it again. We should see 200. That's good. And if we refresh, sweet, they all worked. Okay. Um, so that's probably... <laughs> That's probably enough um, for today, I reckon. Uh, you guys have any questions?